أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى أحد بيتك المذنومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا مذنوم يا أجشان كربلا ما خاب من تمسك بكم والأمن من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا ماكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والأستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وأعلم أن الله يعلم ما في أنفسكم فاحضروا وأعلم أن الله غفور حليم أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه وسلم الله عليه as we mentioned last night, the human being is distracted by a whole host of distractions. Every moment when we're walking on the street, we don't even have the opportunity to look up at the sky because we're always looking down at our phones. We're never, we're never able to hear the words of those around us or the birds that are chirping in the skies because our ears are plugged with our headphones. Distraction after distraction, even during the course of those moments when we have to be most fixated in terms of understanding that we are in the presence of our Creator. During prayers, for instance, when we are praying our oblig uh, obligatory prayers, the moment in which we should feel the most in terms of presence to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in reality we see that we are least in terms of presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the course of our prayers. We think about everything else except for the prayer while we're performing the prayer. While we're performing tawaf around the holy Kaaba, because of the rush, because of the pushing, because of the shoving, because of the hunger, because of the exhaustion, we're thinking about what we're going to eat afterwards instead of understanding that right in front of us is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're just a human being that is so filled with distraction and sometimes we need to just learn how to let go. And so we are taught within Islamic tradition about the importance of performing certain rituals like that of dhikr like that of being in the state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And being in the state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it takes time to cultivate in and of itself. It's not just a ritual that we perform where I state Allahu Akbar or Alhamdulillah or Subhanallah or La ilaha illallah or any one of the adhkar that we've been taught. It's about understanding that during the course of that ritual that we're performing, that we have an understanding of what it is that we're reciting. And that through that recitation, again, it's a means by which it brings us closer toward our Creator, whereby we feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, he tells his companion, Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, Ya Aba Dhar, that worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as though you see Him, for even though you do not see Him, He sees you. And as Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, he states in Dua Arafa, this most perfect supplication, he states, Allahumma j'alni akhsha ka ka'anni araq. Oh Allah, allow for your presence to be filled in my heart to the extent that when I'm praying and that when I'm supplicating to you, I see you. And when that man, he goes toward Ali ibn Abi Talib and he says, Oh Ali, do you see the God that you worship? To which he responds, how can I worship a God that I do not see? But I do not see him through the eyes of my face, but I see him through the eyes of my heart. When we go toward understanding the meaning of this term mindfulness these days, which is super popular, it speaks toward this idea of understanding where you are at a particular moment. 
to being self-conscious of your consciousness, to being really fixated at that particular moment to carry out whatever task that you're carrying out. And today we see that we allow for all unique supplements or supplemental lifestyles to allow for us to be in a state of focus at a particular time. When you're going to work, you need to make sure that you have drunk some coffee before because you feel that yourself is a lot more alert when you've intaken some caffeine. And then when your afternoon meeting comes, again, you need another cup of coffee because you know that that's the mechanism by which you are going to be in a state of focus. Other people, they do a whole load of other unique and strange things, for instance. If they have a very important day, they're going to have a routine the night before. Me, when I'm giving a lecture, especially an important one like these during the nights of Muharram, I have a particular routine that I have to follow. And if anything goes wrong in that routine, the entire lecture is going to go wrong. Even though probably it won't go wrong, but in my head, it's going to go wrong. So I cannot eat three hours before the meal. I need to have the water bottle to my right-hand side. The other day it was on the left-hand side, and you saw me pick it up and you move it to the right-hand side. I need to make sure that every single one of my lectures are in three different dimensions. <laughs> I have to begin with a certain praise and then recite one verse of the Qur'an and make sure that my preparation on the day of begins the night before where I review my notes after everyone else goes to sleep. Then when I wake up in the morning, the first thing that I have to do is review my notes again. Then every time I get any free time, I'm going to look at it again. Other people, for instance, before they exercise, they take, for instance, a pre-workout shake or a supplement or whatever it might be in order that they're in a state of mindfulness and focus during the course of what it is that they're going to do. It's natural. We want to be in control of what it is that we are going to do at any particular moment. At work, taking an exam, while we're exercising, while we're doing anything significant that is important to our day-to-day -day lives. And again, we feel many a time that if all of those forces and all of those energies are not in the right place, our consciousness for that particular task is not going to be as present as it should be. And again, we talk about this word presence quite a bit. When we speak about this notion of mindfulness, which again is not really a term that's founded within Islamic tradition, but I'll get into that in just a couple of moments. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that the human being should have what is known as basira of their own selves. In the Arabic language, the word basara means to see. Basira, when it comes toward the Quran, and when it comes toward the hadith literature, is again not the sight of the eyes, but it's the sight of the heart. The ability to see where you are at a particular moment and have control over where you are. Let me give you an example. When someone is very, very hungry, when someone is thirsty, when someone is very tired, when someone has a lot of stuff going on in their life that is allowing for them to accumulate a lot of stress, we often react in ways that we probably don't like. We get angry, we get frustrated, we use bad language. And then we often regret many a time when we act that way and we blame it on the fact that we were tired, that we were hungry, that we were thirsty, so on and so forth. It's natural. Every single human being, when they're undergoing these difficulties, when they're undergoing these stresses, they often act in a way that's unlike themselves, that's a bit out of character. And oftentimes we wish that we could take that moment back. And the reason why we deflect it and we say that the reason why that happened was because I'm tired, was because I'm hungry, was because I'm sleepy, was because of all of these reasons, is because we didn't have control over ourselves at that moment. When it comes toward being in a state of presence, as founded within the Quran and within Hadith, having basira of your own self, it's about understanding that you need to be engaged with every single moment of your life. And that any time that you slip, even if it's the slip, there's potential for it to go in the wrong direction real fast. If you lose focus for one moment when you're driving a car, for one moment, all of a sudden, what has the potential to happen? It could lead to the detriment of your own life, the life of the passengers in your vehicle, and perhaps... Please recite one more. Allah. So 
we go back again toward this idea that if we lose focus when we're driving for just one moment, it could be detrimental. If we lose focus at a moment that is seemingly as trivial as just driving a car or crossing the street, we're not looking at the cars that are passing us by, it could be to the detriment of our own physical bodies. But as we touched base last night, as we're going to touch base many more not, m m during many more nights, that that which is far more significant than your physical is your spiritual. And thus, if we're not in a state of consciousness at any particular moment, it can lead to a lot of issues for your personal growth and your spiritual development in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, when we talk about this idea of mindfulness, it's about to be in a state of consciousness, to be in a state of understanding, to be in a state of recognition of everything that is around you, and that's how you want to pursue everything in your life. Because when we are focused, when we are digital, when we are diligent, when we are determined, the product is going to be that much greater. Everyone following what I'm saying? And so when we talk about this term mindfulness within Islamic tradition, as I mentioned before, it doesn't have one very clear term within our scripture. But we have numerous sort of anecdotes and ahadith and Quranic verses that speak to the importance of being in a state of presence. And I want to be able to understand the idea of mindfulness in Islamic tradition in three different dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of understanding what is mindfulness in Islamic tradition. Secondly, in terms of how we can become mindful in our day-to-day -day lives. And thirdly, the, ben the benefits of mindfulness as explained within the Quran and the Hadith literature. As for the first dimension then, what is mindfulness? Again, like I mentioned, there's no specific term that equivocates to it to the exact definition. But we have one term within our ahadith known as muraqaba, or what is known as muraqabat nafs which is amongst the most important spiritual stations that a believer has to seek toward ascending to if they really want to understand their creator. People have to go through different stages in their life. And it takes a lot of time toward going through these unique stages, toward again really being in the state of feeling the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone says, I really struggle with my prayers. My prayers don't allow for me to feel connected to God. Or I don't even think about God during the course of my prayers. Someone might say, for instance, that I went for Hajj, I went for Umrah, I went for Ziyarat. I fast during the holy month of Ramadan, but there are only certain moments during the course of all of these spiritual experiences that allow it for me to really feel a sense of connectivity. Maybe when I was reciting Dua Jawshan on Laylatul Qadr, maybe when I heard the Masaib of Imam Al-Hussein, maybe the first time I saw the Kaaba, maybe when I witnessed the grave of the Prophet maybe when I was making Dua on the plains of Arafat, Maybe one of these moments, maybe none of these moments. Everyone connects to something differently that allows for them to really feel the presence of God. But the idea is to allow for that feeling to be in a state of perpetuity. Or rather, we're always feeling it. Otherwise, what's the point of this long journey of ours? If we're not every single day ascending a new stage and getting to a new height, then there's a lot of effort that we need to put forth more so than we are doing at this moment. And so scholars have extracted and deduced from the traditions of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, this term again known as muraqabat nafs which comes from the root word raqib one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-raqib which is what? Which means the all aware or the all vigilant. The idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sees us at every single moment during the course of our life. And that the believer, naturally then, if they are in a state of understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of every single one of our actions and every single one of our deeds, and more so even every one of our thoughts, then we just be that much more careful about every single one of our behaviors. And again, going back toward that idea of mindfulness, having a sense of consciousness of your own consciousness. That you know where you are at every single moment. 
And if you see that God is above you at every single moment, then, you, then at the very least you know, you have a sense of consciousness that I am a creation and that He's the Creator. And that every single thing that I do, and every single word that I speak, and every single thing that my ears hear, and that my eyes see, if I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is vigilant and is aware over every single one of those things, all of a sudden it would influence our behavior tremendously. Which is why in the tradition, Imam Muhammad al-Jawad, our ninth Imam, alayhi salatu wa salam, he gives us a little bit of insight in regards toward the meaning of muraqabat al-nafs. Again, the sense of awareness over our own self. He states, وَأَلَمْ أَنَّكَ لَنْ تَخْلُوا مِنْ عَيْنِ اللَّهِ فَانْظُرْ كَيْفَ تَكُونَ That no, O believer, the Imam Ali is saying, but no, O believer, that there's never going to be a moment when you are hidden from the sight of your Creator. You're never going to be hidden from the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God is going to see you at every single moment, of every single day, of every single year of your existence. And then the Imam alayhi salatu wasalam says, so be. So now be, who you, now be who you have to be. Because all of a sudden, you just know that if that's the case, then you're just going to start behaving. For instance, when we were kids, we know certain things that we can get away with because our parents are not there. When we were at the workplace, many of us were adults. Most of us are adults. All of us, inshallah, are adults. At the workplace, you know that there's certain, perhaps, rules that you can bend at the workplace, especially when your manager is not there. So you can go on your phone and check your Twitter, update your Instagram, whatever it is that you got to do. You can extend your lunch break 15 minutes. But when your boss is there, there's no way in hell that you're going to go longer than an hour or 45 minutes or however long that it is. Because you don't want to mess with that. Imam Jawad, alayhi salatu wasalam, he states, that know that every single moment of your life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. So just watch your back. Be in a state of cautiousness. And the verse that I began with, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 2, through the Baqarah verse 235, he states, He states, O oh humanity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, O oh you who believe, that know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything that is within yourself. فحضروا. So be careful. <laughs> so be wary. وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ حَلِيمٌ And this is the best part of the verse. And I'm telling you, my friends, the Qur'an is so beautiful. And if you just spend some time to like, think about it, just once in a while, you'll see just the uniqueness of not only the book in of itself, but about the greatness of our Lord. So in the beginning of the verse, God states, for instance, O oh, you who believe, know that God sees everything that is within yourself. So be careful. All of a sudden, we're careful. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the way that He does, because He is Arham al-Rahimeen, and He is Khayr al-Satireen, He states, وَأَلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ حَلِيمٌ So number one, He states, know that God knows everything that is in your heart, and then he states, and also know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-forgiving and is the all-patient. Think about it. So all of a sudden, we get scared. We say, oh man, God knows everything. That's right, I forgot. God knows everything. I'm in trouble. How about that thing that I thought? Or that I thought that I thought? God knows that too? Yeah, God knows that too. <laughs> and then we start to get really, really worried. And then we almost enter into a state of despair. Look at all the sins and the transgressions and the vices. How many times have I prayed, but I really wasn't praying. I was just going through the motions. How many things did I do that were good, but in reality, the intention behind it really wasn't all that good? God knows all of those things. We begin to enter into a state of fear of our own selves. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He also gives us a promise. He states, وَأَنَّهُ And know, and also know. It's a command. For those of you who understand the Arabic language, it's fi'lul amr. And know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's also the all-forgiving. And He's al-halim 
Ghafoorun Haleem. You know what Haleem means? Not the food, huh? <laughs> Haleem comes from the root word Hil. Hil means forbearance. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so patient with us that He keeps on giving us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. He knows where we've done things wrong and He will never shut the door on us. He'll give us another opportunity and He'll keep that door open again. Which is why the human being always has to be between these two states. All of a sudden we become fearful that God knows everything about everything and He states that He knows everything in your own selves. And then immediately he offers a sense of hope. So fear and then hope. And never, ever, ever lose sight of either one of these two. A couple of years ago during Muharram, I gave a lecture about fear and hope as narrated within the Quran in Ahlul Bayt. There's a tradition from the Messenger of Sallallahu in these days, La yakunu mu'min mu'minan hatta yakunu khaifan raja'a that a believer cannot be a believer until he or she is between these two states. Hope in the mercy of God, but also fearful of God's wrath and of His punishment. You can't prioritize one over the other. It's about being in a state of mindfulness that at every moment within our life, we have the potential to attain a reward, but we also have the potential to slip. And every single time we slip, we also know that we have the potential for mercy, and we're continuously on this cyclical process of progression. It's like a mutual fund. You put in a little bit of money, you're going to lose a little bit one day. But eventually, in the long term, it's going to grow. So it's all about. Your spirituality is the same way. You invest a little bit into it, and you're not always going to be successful, but it's going to take time. And when you slip, again, you know the mercy is there. But then when you get so clingy toward the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you think your investments are all set, they drop. You're like, oh man, what am I going to do now? What else can you do except get back up the next day and strive again? And that brings me again then to the second dimension of my discussion. And that is in regards to exactly then how can we be a people who are mindful? How can we be a people who really are in a state of muraqabatin nafs? Or again, the translation of muraqabatin nafs being having a sense of vigilance, having a sense of awareness over our own selves at every single moment of our lives. A couple of different things, but before it, it's important to note that if we are not hard on our own selves and we are not aware or we don't make the striving or the effort to be aware of our own selves, then no one else will give us a handout. And that's just the reality of things, especially when it comes to our spirituality. When it comes toward building your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people can offer support, but you have to put in the work, and that's just how it is. You can't copy off someone's homework, because when the teacher's not there, it's the teacher's not there, and you know where to bend the rules. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we just said, He's always there. <laughs> There's no cheating on the exam. You can't take someone else's prayers. You can't take someone else's fasts. You can't take someone else's charity. You certainly can't take someone else's night prayer. Every single one of us have to enter into a state of account for our own selves. And it starts by taking account of our own selves. To really asking yourself, where is it that I'm at? Why is it that I lose control of myself so many times that allow for me to act in ways that I normally wouldn't act? Why is it that I can't focus on an exam? Why is it that I can't focus at work? It starts with a mindset that you tell yourself you can do it, and then you can do it. You can't just assume <coughs> that the only diagnosis to all of your problems is drinking a cup of coffee. It's not going to help you in every single phase of your life. You know when you're tired, when you want to focus in the meeting, you drink the cup of coffee. When you want to go and you want to focus in your workout, you have your pre-workout supplement. Those are things that you diagnose and you realize how you can progress in that particular task. When it comes to your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to the way that we act with others or speak with others or engage with others, it's not going to be fixed by a supplement. It's going to be fixed by effort and diligence and a sense of real focus and understanding of who we are as a human being. And the first step is to know that we're a human being with faults. 
We're a human being that has a lot of errors. We're a human being that is not void of sin. Which is why in one of the sermons of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, the sermon known as Khutbat al-Muttaqeen, the sermon of the pious, he states about the qualities of those who have a sense of God consciousness, that sometimes people go up to them and they praise them. Someone comes and gives you a compliment. You recite it very well. You're really good at your job. Whatever it is, someone, does, someone says something nice about you to your face. The one who has taqwa, the one who has a sense of God consciousness, they respond by stating, Ana a'lamu. That they state, for instance, Ana a'lamu bi nafsi min ghayri wa rabbi a'lamu bi min nafsi. That when someone comes and they offer you a sense of compliment, you respond to them by saying that, Oh Allah, that I am more knowledgeable about myself than what other people know. That's it. You humble yourself. Someone says, you're an amazing person. I'm sure you are an amazing person. Everyone is better than what is often perceived in our mind. You see someone, it's their first time coming to the program, you could say, hey, where you been? Like I tend to do. <laughs> I haven't seen you for the last five days. But the assumption should never be that they weren't engaged in terms of getting closer toward God or that they're not a lot closer to God than I. That's arrogance. That's pride. For me, anyone, for me or anyone else to think like that. So what is it that we have to be doing then? We have to have good opinions of others, but we have to keep a lesser opinion of our own selves. And this is something that's hard to do. Because oftentimes we beat ourselves up and we're very, very hard and difficult on ourselves. And I don't mean that we should be in a state of self-deprecation, whereby we feel that we are no good and that we're going to go to hell and that's it. But rather that we always see there's room for improvement. And how do we do that? Except if we are a little bit critical of who we are. Or in other words, except if we have an accounting for our own self that takes place on occasion. Or in other words, that if we are not amongst those who practice muraqabat al-nafs, or we are not amongst those who are, have a sense of real vigilance and understanding of who we are at any particular moment, then we're never going to be able to get toward that state of real understanding and real progress. So the Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, he states about these muttaqeen, those who have taqwa, that when someone praises them, they state, Ana a'lamu bi nafsi min ghayri wa rabbi a'lamu bi min nafsi that I'm more knowledgeable about myself than what other people know. Someone praises me, yeah, they don't know the sins that I commit in the darkness of my home. They don't know what I did yesterday. They don't know what thought came into my mind. They don't know what I heard. They don't know what I said. They don't know how I abused somebody else. Wa rabbi a'lamu bi min nafsi and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has more knowledge about, is more knowledgeable about myself than even myself. Who knows yourself better than your creator? Allahumma, they state, these individuals who have taqwa and they feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who are God conscious, Imam Abu Alayhi Salaam states, Allahumma la tu'akhadni bima yaqulun. Oh Allah, don't take me by what the people say about me. Don't judge me by what the people say. وَجْعَلْنِي أَفْضَلَ مِمَّا يَظُنُّونَ And oh Allah, allow for my station in their hearts and their eyes to be even better than what they think. We want people to love us. We want people to respect us. وَاغْفِرْ لِي مَا لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And oh Allah, forgive me of those sins which they don't even know about. That's someone who's aware of their own self. حُرْ الْرِيَاهِ on the day of Ashura. He states, Inni ara nafsi bayna jannati wa nar. That surely I see myself. I see myself. That's what I'm talking about. Having a sense of mindfulness. I see myself between paradise and the fire spot. And when it comes toward that second question that we want to pose in terms of how is it that we can be amongst those who attain a sense of mindfulness, as taught to us by the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wasalam, there are three points. The first one of these is that we always have to be in consistent contemplation and reflection of our own mortality. If we know that we're not going to live this life forever, 
that again, just things are put into perspective, whereby we will be that much more careful with every single one of our deeds and every single one of our actions. Can everyone please move forward one more time and recite one more salawat, if you don't mind. <laughs> Is that hot in here? Man. <laughs> this <thing is> <laughs> The first one of these points that we need to understand, and that we really need to engage with, is being in a state of contemplation of our own mortality. Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam in a tradition, he states, An-nasun niyam, that all of humanity, they're in a slumber. Everyone is asleep. And when they die, they will wake up. Everything all of a sudden makes a lot more sense when death takes place. How many of you have ever had, we just mentioned that three of our community members have family members that just passed away? Or two, and one that we are recollecting their tragedy today. How many of you have ever had someone in your family who has passed away? Most of us. Everyone has to deal with the reality of death. One third of the Quran as I mentioned a couple of nights ago is dedicated towards speaking about death and the afterlife. It's a reality. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ بَعَقَتِ الْمَوْتِ that every human being shall taste death. It's a reality. How come we don't like to talk about it? What's more guaranteed than our own mortality? Once we're alive, we know that that's going to be the end objective. If we think about it once in a while, everything allows for a sense of real clarity. Things start to make sense. You know you're not living for this anymore. You're living for something greater. We like to deflect and we like to push it away because we don't want to have a sense of awareness of our own selves. Or we're not in a state of real consciousness over our own consciousness. They said that one day Musa السلام, was walking in the desert and he saw this man who was had, had his hands raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was weeping and he was crying and he was making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The du'a of the gharik, the hadith it says. The du'a of the one who's drowning. We're taught that when someone wants to have their du'as and their supplications accepted in parenthesis, they have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the supplication of the one who is drowning in the ocean. Meaning you have absolutely no other hope than in God. And then only through that you will find that your difficulty will be removed. You can't just say, oh Allah, come on, why don't you give me this? It's so unfair. God is so unfair. Can't believe it. <coughs> no, you need to ask du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a state of absolute and utter desperation. <coughs> so, Musa alayhi salam, he sees this man making du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way. And he's crying and he's weeping and he's grieving. And Musa alayhi salam, he's worried about this man. He says, maybe I can come and help them. Maybe I can be the means by which his supplication is answered. And at that moment, Musa alayhi salam to speak with God. We call him Musa Karimillah, the one who spoke to God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Musa, he says, Oh Musa, that even if this man, he wept until he died, I would not accept anything from him. He says, Oh Allah, but he's in desperation. Look at him. Why not? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa alayhi salam, He says, because every morsel of food in his body is haram, the clothes that he's wearing is haram, his property at home is haram. Meaning that he's accumulated uh, forbidden wealth, and that he's spent it for all of his provisions and all of his life, and now he's complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that nothing is going well in his life. And then Musa alayhi salam says, so what's the way out for him? He says, he should think about death or he will only see the reality of the situation at the time of death. Everything starts to make sense. When someone in your family passes away, nothing else matters. Not your work, not your school, not your job, not your finances, not your own problems, not your own stresses. Because you've lost someone who's so close to you. And we wish we had one more day with that person, one more conversation with that person, one more interaction with that person. Mortality just changes things. Death changes things. 
It allows for us to be centered all of a sudden. doesn't matter how tired you are, how hungry you are, everything starts to make sense. So number one, think and contemplate about death. In a hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, he states that nothing breaks the desires of this dunya in the same way as the contemplation of death. A second step that we take, that we find within the traditions of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam, to be in a state of muraqaba, to be in a state of vigilance and understanding and awareness of your own self, to be in a state of mindfulness, is to once in a while isolate the, dis- isolate the distractions by solitude to being in a state of solitude, to being alone. And being alone doesn't mean being alone from people, it means being alone from distractions. There's a difference between the two. You can be with people, but still connected to God, because not, none of the people around you are distracting you in terms of allowing for that progress, for you to get closer to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why that one day it is said that Prophet Dawood was gathered with some of his companions and they were making dua to him in the plains of Arafat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the opportunity to go and visit Arafat next year and every year during the day, during the days of Hajj, inshallah. It is a custom of even the previous prophets who were making dua to Arafat. It is said that Dawood Prophet David, he was praying with all of these companions of his, and they were supplicating and they were making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so on and so forth. And then Dawood, he got up from that gathering, and he left, and he went by to a you know, nearby pond. And he sat there, and he, suppli- and he began to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his own. Jibra'il comes down to him, and he says, Oh Dawood, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking why you left the gathering that you were in and came to pray over here. You are their prophet. Pray with them. Engage with them. Communicate with them. He says, O oh, Jibra'il, I wanted to be in a state of loneliness between myself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, could you focus on that gathering? He said, I could focus on that gathering. But I was afraid that God would not hear my voice. To which Jibra'il, he says, what do you see in this river, in this pond, in this body of water? He says, I see some rocks. I see some worms. He said, I see some leaves, whatever it is, sand. He says, look to the depths of it and what is the last thing that you see, the deepest thing in this body of water that you see. He says, I don't know, I see some dark rock. He said, under that rock, Jibrayat is telling him, that under that rock, there's a worm. And when that worm, it makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God hears that dua. And you think that he's not going to hear yours. So again, it's not being in a state of loneliness. And I don't mean loneliness in that way. I mean in a state of solitude, solely that you are alone in a room or in a gathering or whatever it might be, that you're supplicating to God in that manner. It's about being in a state where you are not being distracted by your phone or by text messages or by your emails with none of that. You're only focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After you pray, what's the first thing that we're taught to do? Within Islamic tradition, anyone. What's the first thing that we're taught to do after we conclude our obligatory prayers? Tasbih al zahra 34 times Allahu Akbar, 33 times Alhamdulillah, 33 times SubhanAllah. We make a dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the first thing that I do when I complete my prayers? Look at my phone. How many of us do that? How many of us look at our phones immediately after we finish our prayers? It took two and a half minutes, man. I'm talking to myself. Why do you need to look at your phone after two and a half minutes? Think about it. We're so filled with distractions in our lives that we never have a time alone between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in the moments, even in the moments when we have the opportunity to connect with God unlike any other during, for instance, a a pilgrimage, during, for instance, a unique spiritual experience, the first thing that we want to do when we see the Holy Kaaba, take selfie. I remember a couple of years ago, I was going for the ziyarat of the Arba'een of Imam Hussein I was going with the group, and we were walking from Najib to Karbara. And when we were getting toward Karbara, my goodness, I cannot stress this enough, there is nothing like Karbara. There is nothing like Karbara. It's such a unique place. It's such a beautiful place. If you've not been to the ziyarat of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you that opportunity. 
it is unlike anything else. We have a hadith that states, Murru shi'atuna ila ziyarat al That persuade our followers to go and make the pilgrimage toward visiting the grave site of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi So I'm trying to do my part in allowing for myself to get that opportunity and allowing for myself to get the intercession of the Imam by fulfilling his instruction. By inviting you all to go and perform this incredible visitation toward the grandson of the Messenger of God, alayhi salatu wa salam. We were walking and imagine the first time Allahu Akbar, for those of you who know the experience, the first time from a distance when you see the dome of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, you recollect all of the tragedy of that which transpired on the day of Ashura. And you're so overwhelmed with emotion. People are crying and they're falling to the floor and they're, they're, they're rethinking the episode of the day of Ashura. We're walking and we're walking and we're walking. And someone is in tears and they're so overwhelmed with emotion. They're like, I need to capture this moment. They go and they take a selfie and they get posted on Twitter, man. What's the need for that? Taking the experience. That's a moment of connectivity with God and with His Prophet and with His family. Peace and blessings be upon them. Why do you want to ruin that moment? To share it with the world? You can share the experience. By, you, can take the, you can take the photo five minutes after. You can check your phone two minutes later talking to myself before I'm talking to anyone else. Again, being in a state of solitude. The Prophet والسلام, he would often go to the Mount of Haram. And he would go and he would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he would, he would be physically alone because that's the way that he would feel a sense of connectivity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, they can study in a place that's super quiet. You go to the library over here, anyone ever been to the library here at NYU? I just started my doctorate program. It's my daughter's first day of school. It's also my first day of school today. <laughs> I went to the library to finish a paper last week for my summer class. And man, I haven't been to a library in 10 years. It's like an academic library. And I'm just sitting over there and there's nobody talking. There's all these signs, quiet, 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 quiet. I just like dropped the phone charger on the floor. I thought someone was going to come and kill me. <laughs> Everyone looks at me. I'm like, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm whispering too loudly. And, I was, and then I realized after like, typing, I'm typing too loudly. So I was like, you know what, forget this, I can't work over here anymore. So you started working at Starbucks. <laughs> Some people, they like a little bit of noise. It's okay. That's the way that they focus. That's the way that they see themselves in a state of solitude. So you find what works for you is what I'm trying to say. And what allows for you to be in a state of connectivity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through consistent solitude, through consistent effort of understanding where you are at a particular moment, then you're going to be able to cultivate this notion of muraqaba, this notion of mindfulness. And thirdly and finally, in regards toward those traditions that we have, in regards to how we can attain the state of real awareness over our own selves, is again to be in a state of meditation and contemplation and in reflection. And I've said this a lot over the last couple of nights, I'm going to run through this super quickly. What are the things that we need to be in a state of reflection about? Number one, think about the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sun, the moon, the stars, the oceans, the rivers. All of these are meant to be a means by which we get closer toward God, number one. Number two, think about your own self. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ We placed our signs within your own selves. How unique of a human being are you? How much potential do you have? How much ability do you have? Know your place in this world. But also think about who you are physically. How come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with ten fingers and ten toes, and not eight, and not seven, and not eleven? How come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed our eyes on our face and not on our feet? How come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for us to walk on our feet and not on our fours? Thirdly, be in a state of contemplation about these verses of Behold the Qur'an, Tadabbur al-Qur'an. Think about it. Discuss it with your friends. There's something beautiful about it. Think about it. And you'll find that again, a sense of understanding will overcome you all of a sudden, where you'll be so focused in all of your other life responsibilities. And fourthly, and finally, reflect and contemplate and meditate about the greatest of God's signs. That's the Prophet and his family, peace and blessings be upon them. Alayhim salatu wa salam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.
Thirdly, our third dimension in regards toward the benefits of this idea of muraqabat al nafs. The thirdly, the benefits of mindfulness. The first one of these benefits is that when we are in a state of understanding and consciousness over our own selves, we'll just be more better in the now, like we mentioned before. We'll be more focused in the moment that we are in at this particular moment. How many of you have lost focus during the course of the last 40 minutes while I've been speaking? Fair enough. MashaAllah. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> you guys are honest. Need to bring back the jokes. Forget this. <laughs> Scrap this lecture. Tomorrow, we'll start again. <laughs> How many times do we lose focus? How many times do we go in and out? Why? Why is that the case? Because it's long. Because it's boring. Because it's hot. Because someone's sitting next to me. Because someone's bothering me. Someone's touching me. Why is this person sitting so close to me? There's a lot of space to the right. There's a lot of space to the left. Why does this guy always have to talk for 45 days? Why do they talk for an hour? Why can't it just be 35 minutes? Why can't it be something more interesting? Why can't it be something more engaging? Where is the lecture on, do on, 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 on black magic anyway? <laughs> because we want something more, but all of a sudden, if we fashion ourselves to be in a state of understanding that we are in the majlis of Sayyid al-Shahada, Abi Abdullah ibn Hussein, alayhi salatu wasalam, it doesn't matter who's speaking. It doesn't matter what's being spoken. It doesn't matter the content. Because you've come here for, to attain blessing. We get so caught up on so many things. I'm not going to go to this gathering because that guy is speaking. And that guy follows that marja. And he studied in that seminary. Who cares, man? It's the majlis of Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. These places are sacred. And when we understand that this place is sacred, every moment and everything that anyone says, I try to be receptive to it. And if it was something silly, something I couldn't benefit from, okay, I don't benefit from it, no problem. But we try and we strive our best toward being in a state of understanding of where it is that we are at any given moment. You're taking an exam that's two or three hours long. You're sitting in a lecture. You're sitting in a class. And it's taking a long time, or even if it's not taking a long time. We often tend to lose focus, but once you understand what it is that you're trying to seek, you're not going to lose focus anymore. You say, snap out of it. Get it together. I'm taking an exam. I need to focus. The professor is looking at me, he knows that I'm not focusing. You think that I don't know who's focusing and who's not? Come on, man. I've been doing this for a long time. You got a lot of miles on me. I know everyone who listens and everyone who doesn't. And it's totally fine. Some of my closest friends don't listen half the lecture. It's all right. You know who you are. <laughs> but once you understand where you are, and understand what it is that you're seeking, you see the benefit. You take control over yourself. And then you're more, there's more potential for you to make an impact moving forward. Keep this in the back of your mind. Number two, the second benefit of being in a state of muraqabat in nafs is that you're able to work on your flaws. Someone says, I'm perfect. I don't have any flaws. Well, that one has the most flaws. Every single one of us, we have an opportunity to improve some phase or some facet of our lives. And when we know who we are and where we are at any moment, then we also know what it is that we can improve upon. Are we prideful? Are we arrogant? Are we too much in love with this dunya? What are we attracted to? That of power, that of wealth, that of status, that of friendship, that of likes on our Instagram page. Whatever it is that attracts us, that takes away from a sense of focus, is consuming us in a way that we're not able to make progress, or at the very least that we realize that we can make an improvement in this regard. That's what it's all about. It's about accounting for your own self, and sitting down and thinking about where it is that you can improve on a day-to-day -day basis. Because we never want to get complacent, not in our religion, and not in our regular lives either. Not that our religion and our regular lives don't intertwine, but I mean in terms of our spiritual cultivation of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor with our worldly desires in this life. You never want to get complacent at work. Why would you want to do that? You want to get better, you want to get to the next stage. You want to be more successful. You want to be the, you want to be the best of the best of who it is that you are. We don't want to get complacent as a community. 
So someone says, we're going to raise $100,000. I say, no, we're going to change it to $200,000. Because why would we want to get complacent? Why would it be okay with something that we know that we can accomplish? What's the point of that? What is the joy in life? It doesn't make any sense. If we're a human being, then we want to strive to get better. There was a companion, his name was Muhammad ibn Muslim, a companion of Imam Muhammad al-Baqar. Alayhi salatu wasalam, one of our most famous narrators of ahadith. He was from amongst those known as al-Ishab al ijma Amongst those most authentic narrators of the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wasalam. He was known as the face of the Shia of Kufa. He lived in Kufa in Iraq. And he was a representative of Imam al-Baqar, alayhi salam, over there. He used to lecture in the Grand Mosque, give people uh, lessons on Quran and on Fiqh and so on and so forth. And the Imam Ali Salam, he appointed him to take that responsibility. It is said that one day, Muhammad ibn Muslim, he comes toward Imam al-Baqir Ali Salam to visit him as he normally would in order to take advices and, you know, understand what his responsibilities are and so on and so forth. And Muhammad ibn Muslim, he tell, uh, Imam al-Baqir tells Muhammad ibn Muslim, he says, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job teaching. You're doing a great job narrating our traditions. He said, but... One thing that I want you to work on is just humble yourself a little bit. All of the students and all of the authority, maybe, Muhammad the Muslim was an amazing man, but maybe it was influencing him a little bit, getting to his head a little bit, maybe. Not that Muhammad the Muslim was not an amazing human being, again, he was. But the Imam, alayhi salam, was instructing him and telling him, humble yourself a little bit. That's all he told him. He didn't even tell him anything else except for you're doing a great job but just humble yourself a little bit. Imagine someone comes and they are critical of you. Someone not who's random, but someone who's close to you, a close friend of yours. Someone you do go to for advice, for instance, a mentor, and they tell you, you are really, really good at everything, but I think that you should stop getting angry. For instance, I think that you should stop getting this or stop doing that. In a nice way, in a respectful way, many times we get very, very defensive. Who's he to tell me that? Who's she to tell me that? How dare they say that to me? The only reason why they're saying that to me is because they're jealous of me. The only reason why they're saying that to me is because they're arrogant themselves. Because they get angry themselves. So they're projecting. You know, there's a hadith that says that at the end of times, people are not going to be able to take advice. At the end of times, people are not going to be able to take advice. I'm not saying it's the end of time, but I'm just saying we're leading there. <laughs> so Muhammad ibn Muslim, he goes back toward Kufa. He says, okay, Muhammad, no problem. He goes back toward Kufa, and right outside of Masjid Kufa, he saw a bunch of individuals who were selling dates. They were poor. The way that they used to make money is they go and they take some dates from the tree, and they sell those dates. He goes and he says, where do you get these dates from? They said, oh, we go to this farm, and we pay him this much money, and we take these dates, and so on and so forth. Then we come here, we try to make a little bit of a profit. Imagine, Muhammad ibn Muslim is the biggest scholar of Kufa. He's the most important man in that city. He goes to that tree, he picks dates himself, he sits outside of the mosque of Kufa, and he says, who wants to buy dates from me? Might not make a lot of sense to us, but what he was doing at that moment was that he was humbling himself in front of people. Because again, he saw himself as this highly reputable scholar, someone who was much above selling dates on the street like the poor people would but he recognized that he needs to humble himself in front of himself. So that's what he would do. And that's what allowed for him to understand that he needs to be more careful and more vigilant over his own soul. So the benefits that we gain from this idea of mindfulness of muraqabat al-nafs, number one, we become more present in the moment that we're in. And secondly, that it allows for us to correct statements or issues or diseases of our own hearts and of our own souls, again, from the spiritual dimension. So again, when we talk about, in summary, this idea of muraqabat al-nafs, or entering into a state of cognizance over our own selves, is something that takes time. It's something that takes effort. And when we go toward Karbala, we see that Imam al-Husayn, alayhi salatu wasalam, was more aware of his own self because of his understanding of his creator, more so than anyone that we have ever seen within human history. Where do we get this from? On the day of Ashura, Imam al-Husayn, he was fighting in battle. 
And during the course of battle, after all of his companions and after all of his family members had been killed, it is said that he was fighting so valiantly and so courageously and so bravely that one from the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad, they called out, Unduru ilayhi la yubali bil maut. Look at this man, Hussein. Death has not even has not even entered his mind. He hasn't thought about death. Why? Because the only <coughs> thing that Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam saw on the tenth of Muharram was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> this idea that muraqibat al nafs allows for us to see ourselves as servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> and that's all. If I could ask And when we come toward the day of Ashura, and we come toward these personalities and these individuals, and how aware of their own selves that they were, amongst them, of course, is Zainab. Salamullah alayha. Her praises continuously, in perpetuity, and it would not do justice toward the uniqueness of the quality and of the virtue of Zainab. She needs no introduction in the idea that she is the daughter of Ali and the daughter of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. And traditionally, in many communities on the 6th of the month of Muharram, we recollect those difficulties and those tribulations that she faced as we give her her title, Ummul Masaib. She is the mother of all trials. And she is the mother of all tribulations. But before I get there, let me just put it in perspective for you. On the night of the 11th of Muharram, Zainab alayhi salam, she exited from the tent after the battle of Kabbalah. And she made small strides until she saw the body of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in the middle of the plains of Kabbalah. How was the body of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? Do you know? The body that did not have any head. A body that had a missing finger. A body that had been trampled by the horses to the extent that the body of the Imam alayhi salam was imprinted into the ground <laughs> of Kabbalah. Zainab alayhi salam, she goes toward that body of her brother Hussein and she tries to lift up the body of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam from the right side and it falls to the left. And she tries to pick it up from the left side and it falls from the right. And she musters up the courage and the bravery and her strength. And the only thing that she lifts is the chest of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam that didn't have a head. And she called these lines, she called out, Rabbana taqabbal minna hadha al qurban. She says, Oh Allah, accept this sacrifice from us. Who is Zayn? She says, Oh Allah, accept the sacrifice from us. How could Zainab alayhi salam say, Oh Allah, accept the sacrifice from us, in the plural, unless she was a part of that sacrifice or of offering that sacrifice? Before I even get to the Masad, my friends, understand the uniqueness of Zainab alayhi salam. When we come to this gathering, every single one of us can say, Oh Allah, accept this majlis from us. Every one of you can say, Oh Allah, accept this majlis from us. I can say, accept this majlis from us. The ones who donated to the sponsorship can say, Oh Allah, accept this majlis from us. The ones who recited poetry can say, Oh Allah, accept this majlis from us. Because every single one of us are partners in allowing for this message to disseminate. We are partners in the majlis of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Someone outside on the park, can they say, Oh Allah, accept this majlis from us? No, they can say, Oh Allah, accept this majlis from them. But they cannot say, Oh Allah, accept this majlis from us. Keep this to the back of your mind. Zainab alayhi salam, she says, Allahumma taqabbal minna hadha al qurban. Oh Allah, accept this sacrifice from us. When someone wants to offer a sacrifice, they have to have ownership. I can't take your money and then give it in sadaqah. That's not fair, that's not equitable. 
You have to have control and ownership of it on your own. So why does Zainab alayhi salam says, Oh Allah, accept this sacrifice from us. On the first dimension, Zainab alayhi salam was a partner in the message of Hussein. Which is why in one of the ziyarat we say, As-salamu alayka, ya sharikat al Hussein. Peace be upon you, O partner of Hussein. And secondly, why does she say us? The only one who could ever say to Allah, Oh Allah, accept this sacrifice from us, is someone who owns Hussein, or someone who's in a higher status than Imam al Hussein. And in our ideology and in our aqidah, there is no one who is greater than Hussein except for the Prophet Ali, Fatima, and Al Hassan. No one else has a station that is greater than Abi Abdullah al Hussein. But on that day, Zainab salam, she states, Allahumma taqabbal minna hadha al Qurban in that station. And she raised the chest of Aba Abdullah because she represented Ahlul Kisa in their entirety. She represents the Prophet. And she represents Ali, and she represents Fatima, and she represents Hassan, and she represents Hussein alayhi salam in making the dua of all of them on the night of the 11th of Muharram. <laughs> My dear friend Zainab alayhi salam, she lost a lot. She lost her brother Mahsan on the day when the door struck her mother Fatima to Zahra. She lost her brother Imam al Hassan alayhi salam 10 years earlier as that poison began to inflict his body. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow night. She lost her brother Abu al Fadl al Abbas alayhi salam when that arrow pierced his eye and a man came and struck his head. And she lost her brother Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam on the 10th of Muharram. But I'll leave you with this, which is amongst the most tragic moments in the life of Zainab alayhi salam. And for those of you who know the details of the story of Karbala, my dear friends, there is nothing as tragic as this moment. For those of you who have been to Karbala, then you take yourself back to that location known as the Hill of Zainab. And during these days from Muharram, from Ashura until the Arba'in, there's a sign, there's a banner that's hung up on that location known as Till Zainabi. It states, As-salamu alayka ya Jabal al-Sabr. Peace be upon you, O the mountain of patience, because you had to bear the mother of all patience. Because it is stated that when Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam had fallen down from his horse, what happened? One by one, the army of Amr ibn Sa'd, they were fearful to go and be the one who did the deed of severing the head of Imam al Hussein from his body. But Zainab alayhi salam, she was watching from the tent. And one by one, they would come to the Imam, they would see the beauty on his face, remembering that he's the grandson of the Prophet of God. And they would run back toward the tent of Umar ibn Sa'ad. Until Umar ibn Sa'ad, he looks towards Shimr bin the Joshan. And he says, oh Shimr, go and do the deed that you've been asked to do. So the narration states that as Shimr began to run toward the body of Abu Abdullah, Zainab began to run up that tent. And as Shimr Shimr climbed on the body of Abu Abdullah. Zainab, she reached the climax of that hill. And at the moment when he took out the dagger, Zainab began to run down. But at that moment, she froze. She wanted to go and defend her brother, Abu Abdullah. But from behind her, she heard the calls calling out, Oh, our Aunt Zainab, are you going to bring us water? So Zainab, hassalam, she stood in the middle, looking at her brother, Abu Abdullah, and then turning around and seeing Sukaina and she wondered what should I do at this moment as the head of Hussein was severed and as the children of Hussein were crying out the thirst of our aunt Allah rahmatullah ala al-qawm al-balimi inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'un We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing of this night and for the grief in our hearts over our master Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam to make us amongst those who follow in the footsteps 
of Abi Abdullah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our lives resemble the life of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow for our deaths to resemble the death of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad and to grant us their shafa'a and the barzah in the next life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow for, among, for, for those amongst us to be aware of our own souls and allow for us to have our sins forgiven by this grief. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ziyarah of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam in this life and shafa in the next life. But I ask you all to recite one surat al-Fatiha but before that one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah, 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 Allah.